earlier this morning, Friday 19th of February Australia time, jars of peanuts were passed around to a bunch of very nervous scientists. The first time NASA ever successfully made a landing on Mars, someone had brought peanuts. And so, even though these are some of the smartest and most logical people on the planet, every time another Mars landing is attempted, peanuts are shared around for good luck. Well, it must have worked because NASA's Perseverance rover successfully landed on the Red Planet this morning after a seven-month journey. If you watched the live footage from NASA headquarters, you saw those scientists go from anxious to overjoyed. Just as excited, though watching on her computer here in Australia, was Tamara Davis. Tamara is an astrophysicist and she's also a presenter of Catalyst on ABC TV. Her two-part series on Mars and the quest to put humans on that planet begins on ABC TV this coming Tuesday. Hi, Tamara. Hi, how's it going? Is astrophysicist the right title for you or cosmologist? What are you officially? Uh, I usually use astrophysicist. That's the thing that people most recognise. Cosmologist is just, I think, a type of astrophysicist who studies the biggest picture possible. We try and understand the universe as a whole, how it began, how it will end, what the laws of physics are and how all of the mechanics of the biggest picture possible all work. So when you run into someone at a barbecue or at a dog park <laughs> and that and that's your job description, what sort of things do people ask you? What do they want to know about your job? Often I get, oh, well, wow, you you must be really smart, Philip. But what do you actually do? Um, and, uh, like, do you discover galaxies or something like that? I'm like, well, no, discovering galaxies is actually really easy. You, you just point a really big telescope at a place no one has looked at for as long before, just expose your telescope for longer than anybody has done before, and, and galaxies just appear, the ones that were previously too faint to see. So that, that bit's sort of... That's a walk in the park. Although I, I trivialise the, um, the you know very complicated technology and stuff that goes into those telescopes. It's usually just a matter of sort of looking more. But the thing is, we're trying to understand what we see. So when we see these, what do they tell us about the laws of gravity, about the evolution of galaxies, about how our Earth formed, how we ended up with life on Earth, and questions like, are, is there life elsewhere in the universe? So those kind of questions like, are we alone, or what's out there, or, or how did it all come to be, mm -hmm. are those the kind of questions that got you into astrophysics in the first place? Yeah, definitely. It's um, some of the, they're very philosophical questions, really, asking sort of about our origins, but also they're asking about the, the nature of the universe and the how physics works here on Earth. And so things like looking at general relativity. So Einstein had came up with this theory of gravity that did better than Newton's theory of gravity and discovered that things like time and space aren't just fixed. They actually warp and bend depending on how fast you're moving and what gravitational field you're in. And we don't usually see those because, you know, on Earth, the gravitational field isn't that strong and most of us can't really run that fast. But even if given our best jets, it's barely a perceptible type of thing. But if we hadn't figured out that, we wouldn't be able to calculate GPS signals and figure out where we are on a map. So your GPS on your phone uh, is using general relativity every day. And that's just sort of one of those unexpected spin-offs that you get from studying things that might seem esoteric, like black holes and the beginning of the universe. Were you a little kid who spent a lot of time looking up at the stars? Not really. Like I wasn't a um, I didn't have a telescope as a kid or anything like that. I mean, I liked, I love the stars, but I think I was more fascinated by space flight. I remember watching the, the launches of the space shuttles. One of my first memories was as about a, a 10 year old, I was, we studied a particular space shuttle launch and it, it was like a big deal. It was the first time that a teacher was going to get launched into space. This is the challenger. Things. This was the challenger. And so we'd studied all the astronauts and we'd like learnt about the mission and stuff. And I must have been really excited because my parents agreed to wake me up at 3am so we could watch the launch together live on television. And um, of course, it, that was the challenger one that exploded just after a minute after launch. And as a 10 year old sitting there with like, I was like, just like hugely impacted these people that I'd studied and things. And I was like, 
whoa. And what but, did your parents say? Do you remember? Like, how did they try to? They, they were like, well, uh, maybe it's bedtime now. <laughs> oh my gosh! <laughs> uh, I don't think they knew what to say. Did that make you think twice about? This burgeoning passion for space flight. <laughs> I, if anything, it. I walked away from that experience, really wanting to be an astronaut. Why? I saw these people who were willing to give their life for this adventure, this challenge, this really difficult thing. I realised how um, difficult it was, how inspiring it can be to people, um, and yet how risky and dangerous it could be. And that was all just, you know, it was mind blowing and it was really exciting. And I wanted to be part of that. 1986 was the same year that Halley's Comet yes. came by. I, yeah. I, I was 10, about the same age oh, yeah. as yep. you. Do you remember watching that? Yeah, that one. Um, I remember seeing it from our house in Sydney and it was this streak across the sky and I thought that was really cool. And then our parents um, coincidentally took us on a, a holiday on a houseboat out in the, I can't remember, it was the Hawkesbury or something like that. I can't remember. And uh, we woke up in the middle of the night and went and looked at Halley's Comet from somewhere with no city lights, and it just spanned like half the sky. It was incredible. I was just, again, blown away by that. But I remember even at the time I was inspired, you know, there's this pretty beautiful thing in the sky. It's like, wow, but I was really impressed and amazed that humans could know that that was something that was going to come back, that, you know, 75, 76 years later it would come back and we'd see it again. And this was something that had been seen before. And, you know, we held my little brother up who was like six months old or something and like pointed his face at the sky and said, you're, you're the one that's most likely to see this again. Uh, quick, get a good look at it. And he was like, Rah! So it was the, the kind of human ingenuity or human capability when it came yeah. to outer space that, that was really exciting to you. The fact yeah. that we had some power or, or knowledge yeah. of this. Yeah, it's sort of a, a strength. And like people often ask, are you you know, awed or, or do you, is it, does looking at all of this space stuff make you feel small? And I'm like, well, in some ways it makes me feel powerful that, that as humans we can understand what's going on up there and we can pre predict things like that. Uh, and um, as a 10-year-old thinking of, you know, something that happened 76 years ago is – you just like, that's like an ancient history. Like that was just so long. Um, and so to think think about that was probably the, the first spark that I really remember that was like, yeah, this is really cool. Do you remember noticing Mars when you were a little kid? It's hard to miss even for fools like me. Yeah, I don't think I even remember too much. I do remember seeing the planets through telescopes, like one, when the, one of the first times I went and looked through telescopes and you see the planets and see Jupiter and see the moons of Jupiter lined up and you've got this, this planet with moons going around it and then you've got our sun with the, the planets going around it and then you've got the galaxy with all of the stars like our sun going around it and it was like the same pattern on so many different scales uh, and it was like you can see that there's some, you know, universal laws at work, even though they're on all these different scales, that there's some sort of meaning behind this and some methods that show, you know, this is there must be some laws of physics that make this happen this way. So, Tamara, tell me what happened this morning. Why were those scientists <laughs> chowing down on their peanuts and, and so <laughs> you're both anxious and excited? What happened earlier today? So the Perseverance rover landed on Mars. And it's always an incredibly anxious and exciting time when you have a new type of rover or something landing on a different planet. It's a, an enormous, difficult achievement. This morning was the point where the whole spacecraft reached Mars, went smashing through the atmosphere, as tenuous as the atmosphere is, um, parachutes opened and the capsule came, slowed down, approached the the Earth, and then in this crazy, really impressive landing maneuver, it actually had it ejected the parachute, and this uh, space crane basically put, turned on some jets and hovered above the planet and lowered the rover to a gentle touchdown on Mars. <laughs> and why is it so challenging, particularly to land on Mars? What is it about that planet that makes it so extraordinary? Well, it's challenging to land on any planet. It's challenging to park in the car park. <laughs> so, like, this is a whole other level of challenge. <laughs> yeah. Um, but the speeds that you are approaching and stuff uh, is uh, difficult. And there's a, a difference between Earth and Mars in that when satellites or when craft come back and land on Earth, they can use air braking quite effectively. We have quite a dense atmosphere. It can slow things down. On Mars, the atmosphere is much more tenuous. There's basically like 
on barely a like you know basically a percent of what the the pressure that we have on Earth, and so it's much more difficult for it to slow down. And so it might be heating up. Is that that um, part not, the, of it? not even so much that it does heat up as it gets the friction of the atmosphere, but there's just not enough atmosphere to slow it down as much as there would be on Earth. So they have different challenges. So they the they deployed an enormous parachute, like uh, uh, twenty meters wide, I think, and. Uh, and then use these jets and a whole bunch of different things to be able to ni- do a nice, soft touchdown on and Mars. And is that something that the NASA controllers back in the States would have been controlling in real time? No, it was because at the moment it takes about 10 minutes for a signal, a light signal or a radio signal to get to Mars um, and another 10 minutes for it to get back. So it would take, if you they were like, saw something going wrong and they sent a signal, um, it would take 20 minutes for a round trip of that com- communication, by which time the rover would have well and truly crashed. So it had to be all pre-programmed. Yeah, so this was like months and years of work in the past, all gone into the um, robot, and sensors and artificial intelligence figuring out how it was going to do it itself. And the, all of those people eating peanuts in their excited <laughs> control room back on Earth were really just watching the readings come in as the rover reported, I've done this, I've done this, I've done this, and going through all of the steps it was meant to do. And they're like, yep, that's good, that's good, that's good. Um, but from the moment it hit the atmosphere of Mars to the moment it touched down is only seven minutes. And so that means because it takes 10 minutes for the signal to get there, what they're watching and all of these readings that are coming in is stuff that's already happened. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So even though they didn't know it yet, the it rover could happened. already have crashed or landed <laughs> on Mars um, and they were just getting the readings and after the fact. And how targeted could they be or were they about exactly where on the planet yeah, to they, land? They did a really um, precise targeting manoeuvre um, and they were able to... I mean, it's phenomenal technology. They had cameras and things on the bottom of the the lander so that they could, after they were close by aiming at the planet from, you know, chucking this thing from Earth, after they were close, once it was in the atmosphere and stuff, they could look at the ground and take pictures and and, um, figure out a a more precise landing point and land all in that seven minutes of um, doing things. And they were aiming for a really interesting spot on Mars which was a place that that could have in the past been sort of the the, um, base of a, a lake where they think there used to be water. And that's one of the real important aims of this mission is to look for life or not necessarily existent life. It could be fossil life, any evidence, sort of molecular evidence or fossil evidence that there was once life there. So looking at where sediment would have formed and made fossils in a sort of a lake bed type surface right, is so really promising place to look. Just like back on Earth, we're more likely to find fossils in, a, in an old lake bed. Yeah. That's going to be the same, hopefully, on Mars. So they've yeah. managed to land this thing in an ancient in an ancient lake bed. And so that all went to plan. Mm-hmm. Have we got images back yet? Yeah, I saw. That I just saw briefly that they'd sent up a couple of uh, images. They, these were just like the sort of not, not the fancy cameras that they've got there and the fancy sensors, but just images looking around at the general area. How are Australians involved in this NASA mission? So there's a few Australians involved that I know of. I'm sure there's more than I know of as well. But I know um, Abigail Allwood is one of the principal investigators on this NASA mission, and she's in charge of an instrument called Pixel, which is going to make uh, X-ray observations of some of the uh, you know rocks that they're looking at so they can look for the chemical indications of life having existed in there. So this little pixel technology is going to be there on that that Perseverance rover as mm-hmm. it roams about Mars. Yeah, yeah. so it's out there. And David Flannery here in Brisbane has been working on that as well at QUT and his team and a bunch of students and things. So I, I visited them when, the, when Perseverance launched and got to sort of see the excitement and share sort of a celebratory um, champagne of, after the it had successfully launched. These things are so nerve-wracking, you know. They, they, they could crash on launch, they could crash on, on landing. And it but, would just take one bit of code or one wire not, yeah. not to be working perfectly and the whole thing collapses. Yeah. Yeah. And are those teams going to be involved in analysing the information as Perseverance starts sending stuff back as well? 
Yeah, I think they'll, they'll remain in the mission, you know, like involved in the mission and, and trying to understand what they've seen. And here in Australia, we've got some of the rocks that are the most similar to the rocks that, that they're going to look at on Mars. Out in Western Australia, in the Pilbara, there's really ancient rock out there that um, has not been disturbed by geological processes or volcanoes or mountains forming and that kind of thing. It's some of the most pristine and oldest surface rock on Earth. And that it, this sort of Australian experience of studying that is now being transferred to the experience of studying Mars rock. And they found evidence of life, of, of fossil life mm. in those rocks at three billion years or something yeah. old. Yeah, it's really exciting because it, in the in the Western Australia, they've got this evidence for fossilised life, as you say, these stromatolites, which are indicators that life some of this is like quite early in earth's history and some of those early indications of life really show that life on earth emerged pretty much as soon as it could have as soon as earth had a solid surface um, and so life came very early on earth which is really interesting when you're thinking about whether it's easier to make life on planets and whether it, life might appear on other planets as well so scientists are confident there's no life on Mars right now. You know, they're not going to well, turn go around that a far. Con- them, and there might be, what well, there might be life there now. Yeah, there, it, I mean, it's probably not walking, talking green aliens or anything like that, but the possibility of having microbes, like, you know, microscopic life, like we do on Earth, deep in rocks, is still there. Right, so it's not just fossils, it's not just the trace of life that these that this rover is looking for, yeah. but possibly existing life. Exactly. It could be all sorts of different things. And that's that's exciting. Like we uh, one of the things with life on Earth is that we used to think that, you know, you needed quite clement conditions for life to thrive. But now when we look around, people have looked deep in rocks, like deep under the surface, you know, really acidic lakes and things and basically everywhere you go at extreme temperatures extreme pressures depths life is there (laughs) and so it can survive in all sorts of conditions and the conditions on mars for life would have actually like we see that, that there's all of these traces of what is pretty obviously used to be rivers and stuff in the geology of mars and the water on the surface has dried up or is frozen just under the surface now and it doesn't flow freely but there was liquid water on there and the conditions for life, it would have been much better for life on Mars really early in the solar system's history, and possibly even more so than early Earth, because um, Earth was a bit bigger and it took it's closer to the sun, it took longer to cool down, and we would have had um, a molten rock surface on Earth, basically, for much longer than Mars did. And so it's possible even that life um, originated on Mars first, before Earth. <laughs> So Mars once looked really different than it than mm. it does now. And, yeah. and do scientists know what happened? Why why has it changed? Yeah, well, we know that it, it has, for one thing, it's a fair bit smaller than Earth. And so it has less than half of the gravity of Earth. Now, the atmosphere that's, that uh, sort of envelops us, that we love to live in and breathe, is actually slowly evaporating from Earth as well. Particles are floating off the top of the atmosphere all the time. But our gravity is strong enough to hold it together. And we have a really strong magnetic field for the Earth that protects us from some of the particles that are flowing out from the sun, sort of particles that would usually sweep away gas that they hit. And so we are protected from the solar wind and also have stronger gravity. So Earth has been able to keep its atmosphere. Mars being lighter and not really having the magnetic field that Earth does means that it was not able to protect its atmosphere and it evaporated away. The the rover that landed there today, it's not the first to make it to Mars. How long have humans been sending spacecraft to Mars? Well, there were, I think the first ones were in the mid-1970s, and they were actually sent to look for life. There was a lot of interest in life um, back then. And then there was a bit of a, uh, a hiatus on the sort of search for life missions, and people would, did other things and just learned more about the red planet. So it's, you know, many decades now that we've been going, I guess, almost 50 years since we've been going to Mars. And it wasn't always those little robots, those rolling robots that we see now. That's a more recent development. Yeah, having something that's mobile and able to move around on Mars is a great development because you need to be able to explore more than the spot that you've touched down on. And the one that's landed there this morning, Perseverance, how big is it? Like the size of, of of a table or a car? It's car size. Yeah, right. And it's got it's got not only the rover but also um, a helicopter. What? 
foot on it. And, you know, I said that the atmosphere of Mars is pretty tenuous, which means helicopters, it's like flying at really high altitude in on Earth, where the atmosphere is very tenuous. So it's a bit hard to fly, but you've got to make something really light with big blades, and they've done that. And um, so there's now... This is sort of, that's sort of one of the experimental aspects of this because I don't no um, helicopter has ever flown on Mars before. So and has it launched already? I don't think Come so. Right. That's that's um, one of the challenges to come. Incredible. And then, do these rovers make it back, or are they just kind of left up there like this junkyard in space? They're, they're just left as a junkyard at the moment. We they don't make it back. Um. <laughs> <laughs> so, what kind of surface are they going to be exploring? What do we know about what it's like on Mars itself now? Sim- most similar rock on Earth, I think, is the out in Western. Australia, like Western Australia has some great ability to search for really, really ancient rock and fossils because it's big and really old, geologically old. We haven't had many volcanoes and mountains and stuff destroying this sort of pristine ancient surface. And Mars similarly doesn't have as much geological activity as here on Earth. And so it's really old rock. And you've described how the atmosphere is is thinner. What's the gases like? Is it, I mean, what's it like to, can it, can, People can't breathe there. I mean, I'm assuming. What, what's different about the what it would be like for a, for a human lung to be there on Mars? Yeah, you don't want to take your spacesuit off when you land on Mars. <laughs> that's that's for sure. What would happen? Uh, you, well, you wouldn't be able to breathe for one thing. There wouldn't be enough air, um, all the right composition and oxygen. There's no um, uh, free oxygen to be able to breathe. And so that would be... You'd be in big trouble, basically. It's further from the sun than yeah. we are. So is it colder or what's the temperature like? Yeah, so it's it's colder um, and the temperature, because you don't have the atmosphere to hold in the heat as much, the temperature can vary wildly. So depending on whether you're at the poles or in the middle of summer at the, the equator, it can go from like minus 50 Celsius approximately to about plus 30 Celsius. So the way you're describing what this planet looks like with, you know, no air to breathe, rock, no water that we're aware of, a really terrible atmosphere, very little gravity. It takes seven months for a, an unmanned spacecraft to make it there. How could it be possible for astronauts to get there? What would need to happen for humans to be able to make that journey? Yeah, well, we know this. We actually know what it's needed. A bit, you know, humans have travelled to the moon, even though it's been a very long time since we've gone back to visit. And you can uh, live in this inhospitable space, but you need to carry everything that you need with you, including the air that you want to breathe, the food that you want to eat. And if you want to go and live on Mars, you're going to need to have, you're going to need the ability to grow food there in the thing. So you basically would need to take soil, everything that you need. There's, there is things that you can harvest from Mars as well. And there is frozen water under the surface that you could use and things. So that it's not like we can't use the resources on Mars at all. But any microbial life or things that you need to have your plants survive, that all has to go with you as well. Would it be most viable for astronauts to create a base to live on on the planet itself? Where would astronauts live if they were there able to explore the planet? Uh, I think there's, uh, so I'm not an expert on that particular aspect of things. And uh, there's a few different options that people could have. So there's um, one of the things that we do explore in the, the Catalyst episode that is upcoming is that we talked about whether the humans could shelter in natural caves on Mars. And there's these amazing lava tubes that have been discovered on Mars that match some of the things that we see on Earth, where ancient lava poured through and left this like tube, big long tube of rock. And um, that would, might be a place to shelter, have, have some sort of natural shelter and certainly shelter from radiation storms and that kind of thing. And we might go back to being cavemen and women is what you're saying, sort of a (laughs) de-evolution. What about the spacecraft we travel in itself? Is that something that that people could stay in potentially? It depends on whether – the spacecraft are obviously things that you have to live in for a long time just to get there because it takes um, months, as you said, to to actually get there. And so they're viable habitats, but usually spacecraft at the moment just carry the food that you need for the journey Um, You and you would – need to take a lot more food and stuff in in those and most don't land on the surface there so it's it's there's so many different ways to do it it's like uh impossible to say sort of one particular thing what would it be like for a human to spend that long traveling in space what would that do to our bodies i guess we don't know necessarily we have um people who have been up in the international space station for very long periods of time and one of the purposes of that was actually to see what effects that 
space travel has on the human body. And, and so what does it? Your muscles do tend to do waste away. You lose your sense of balance a bit and that sort of thing, which is often why you see once astronauts land, they need a bit of help getting out of their capsule because they haven't had to walk, especially the people who have been up there for like a year. And so you have to relearn some of those skills. Podcast. Broadcast. And online. You're listening to Conversations with Sarah Konoski. Find out more about the Conversations podcast. Just head to abc.net.au slash conversations. Tamara, I know you're not a I know you're not an astronaut, although that was part of the interest that got you first into this field of study. But if you were or if you were invited to mm-hmm. get in a one of those spacecrafts once the science is worked out and be sent off to Mars, would you put your hand up for that? Sure. I, I one of the things I really wanted to do as a as a kid, I, that was in my brain, that I was like, Oh, I really want to be an astronaut. And these days, I'm, I'd probably hesitate more than I did back then in the sense that I've got a fantastic job as an astrophysicist, with that, which I absolutely love, and I love studying space. And But the chance to go and explore it personally and go and visit another planet would be just astounding. Like, you know, the the concept of going and walking on a different planet and being one of the first humans to ever walk on a different planet is just amazing. And uh, it would be such a great adventure to be part of that journey. It's funny, though. I mean, I know that the parallels are often made between the early days of ocean navigation, yeah. ocean discovery, and what's happening with space now. But I feel like back then, if you were in England, you didn't know what was on the other side mm-hmm. of the world. And it might be something like Tahiti. Mm-hmm. Well, now we've seen pictures of what's there. I don't want to go to Mars. <laughs> uh, is, that is not an inviting <laughs> option for me. Yeah. Although I think, granted, the space capsules, though uncomfortable, are probably more comfortable than the ancient mariners <laughs> had on, on the boats that they were travelling around the, the Earth for for months. But it is it does have much sim- many similarities. Like, you know, it used to take nine months or so to get from the UK to here. Uh, and um, those boats were not comfortable. But it's like those that sort of time of journey is how long it's going to take to get to Mars. And we think of that as like a really long time now when we're here in the era of jets where we can get from place to place within a day, no matter where it is on the Earth. But that sense of adventure in humankind still remains and we still want to go and explore. And, you know, we've we've seen the basics of what's there on Mars, but we really don't know all, all that much about it still. There's so much more to learn. And there's some things that you, you're just not going to know until you go and, and, and touch it and, see, and be there and have humans on the planet. And what if something goes wrong and you are seven months <laughs> journey from your own planet? Yeah, well, it's been a great life. I've had fun. <laughs> you know, there are things. There are some things that are uh, uh, will be irretrievable. You know, I've, I've, there's lots of science fiction movies and stuff that are usually based around some sort of calamity happening to the astronaut in question. But there's a lot of people who are willing to take those risks. Um, because it is such a bold and interesting adventure and something that might be worth giving your life to try. As you said, the the purpose of this mission, the one that's just landed Perseverance on Mars, is to see if there is any record of life. If those scientists find life, Mm -hmm. if there is either life now or a trace of, of life once, what does that mean? I think that would be really, it's one of the most profound questions that we have. It would be one of the most profound discoveries in our history. We've wanted to know for ever since we realised that there were other stars out there, what we knew that they were, that there are other worlds and other, probably other planets around other stars. Are we alone in the universe? can see that the the conditions here on earth aren't that rare like you know there's there's planets similar to earth out there we've now know of thousands of planets around other stars and is there life on any of them is there maybe there's just like microbes that are not sort of you know intelligent life maybe there's other walking talking um aliens out there uh we don't know but that's one of the exciting things that this 
type of mission could try and answer. And from a, a, a scientific point of view, if it is found that there was once life or is life mm-hmm. on Mars, does that suggest it's more likely for there to be life on other planets? Yeah, you'd think so. Um, there's, a, there's a few different possibilities. So if we find life on Mars that's the same as life on Earth, so imagine we found the same DNA on Mars and Earth, then that would hint that the two t- lives on the different planets uh, came from the same origin because it's sort of unlikely that DNA would have evolved like that precisely uh, on different pl- in different places. And we know that there's actually a lot of natural exchange of rock between the planets, especially in the past. So if life formed on Mars early, uh, an asteroid whacked it and rock got splattered off the planet into space, that rock floated around for even millions of years, but then some- would eventually crash on Earth, and we get a couple of tons of Mars rock crashing into Earth every year. So it's quite a common occurrence. Some of that rock might have these microbes in it, um, and that might have actually seeded life <laughs> on Earth. So maybe we we're actually Martians. Maybe we come from <laughs> Mars originally. So that's one like possibility. So it'll be like the big question if we do find life is: is it life like we know it on Earth, or is it a completely separate? genesis of life is it's completely separate if it's completely separate then that would indicate that it's really likely that there's life elsewhere because we've only been able to look in detail at two planets if both of them have life that just is like you know chances much are. more likely that life is easy to create and we will we'll find it other places that we look to when you're studying this material and thinking about it is it solely the realm of science or does philosophy make an appearance as well? Like what part of your brain is being engaged in when you look at these questions? Philosophical questions are very much at the heart of some of these scientific questions that we're trying to answer. And the question of is there life in the universe used to be philosophical because it wasn't something that we could bring our scientific instruments to bear on. Um, But now we have the technology to go and actually legitimately search for and try and answer these sort of fundamental um, philosophical questions. I know that you know it's impossible to predict time around discovery, mm. but given how quickly uh, a moon landing happened after mm-hmm. after the, the American government announced that's what they were yeah. going to do, was it ten years or something? Less I mean, than ten less years. Less than yeah. ten years. So, uh, how long might it be? I mean, might it be in our lifetime before people are on Mars or even a human colony on Mars? What do you think? I would be really disappointed if we didn't get people on Mars within our lifetimes. Um, and But the thing is that technology is basically there. We know how to do it. Um, and it's just the will that's been lacking. So when I was thinking about, you know, as a, a growing up and then going to university and seriously thinking about um, going, be, going and traveling to Mars, there were plans of putting the first humans on Mars by the year 2000. Uh, and the technology really is not the limitation. It's just making that decision and putting the resources into it. Money. If we wanted to do it, then we could. And yeah. it's a lot of money. It is it's, a lot of money. It's a lot, a lot of yeah. money. There are other countries that are, are currently um, about trying, about to land on Mars as well. I think China, mm-hmm. the UAE. Yep. Do nations work together collaborative, collaboratively around this sort of stuff, or is it that space race where we're all trying <laughs> to best each other? There's a lot of collaborative efforts around space, and the, one of the things I love about astrophysics and space studies in general and space travel is just how collaborative it can be and how it can bring people from completely different walks of life all together um, to try and achieve a common mission. Uh, and so, but there there is still an element of space race about it, and some of that is sort of escalating, I think, at the moment. Um, and so, maybe that will mean that things get faster going going to some of these other planets. And private business has a real mm-hmm. entrepreneurs have a real interest. Yeah. Elon Musk and and Jeff Bezos they're all funding yeah. rocket schemes and space schemes. I mean, is that a is that helpful? Do you think? Yeah, it is. I think for for in terms of getting up into space and. It's it's a very complicated space, and and um, I mean the the satellites launching satellites is a hugely profitable. That's a really um, important industry. Um, going out and doing space mining is something that might be useful because there's um, interesting elements in, in asteroids that are very difficult to find on Earth. They're very they're deeply buried on Earth, but they're floating around in these asteroids, and so it's getting to the point. Where even like touchscreens and stuff takes them, they to make them requires some elements that are hard to find on Earth um, and might be uh, profitably mined 
in space. I think Jeff Bezos has talked about rezoning Earth as a residential planet and like <laughs> letting everything else in the galaxy be kind of an industrial zone. I don't, I don't know if that's. I'm not sure that yeah, like it's like Antarctica yeah. is like is sort of pristine, and we may want to keep it that way. And that's also an issue with going to Mars. And when if we're going to land on Mars, do we want to keep like? We're going to, one of the, the fears, if we do find DNA that's like ours on Mars, have we contaminated the planet? Is this something that we brought? And so they, they try and sterilize the instruments and stuff as much as possible when they when they launch them so that when they land, anything that they find, they're confident is Martian, not from Earth. But it's, that's, if we do find life, maybe we need to, like, especially if the life's alive there on Mars right now, we may need to cordon off the planet and not disturb it. Like, you know, there's some philosophical aspects. We don't have a great track well. record no, of that as not. a species. <laughs> One of the first things that you studied, Tamara, as an astrophysicist, was dark energy. Mm, yeah. How did you first get hooked by that? So when I went to university, I was I was always fascinated by general relativity and the fact that time and space warp and bend, they're not fixed. I was like, that's just such a crazy and really cool theory. And so I started studying those kind of things and how they apply to the universe as a whole. And I started my degree, uh, my PhD in 1999. And that was when, that was just after they'd discovered this dark energy, which is the name we give to whatever's accelerating the expansion of the universe. So the, ex the discovery that was made was, you know, if, I, if you get a ball and you throw it up in the air, what goes up must come down. The discovery was that that's not always true. <laughs> it just keeps going. So they discovered that it once, that's true on Earth because we're on a really dense um, object. Um, but once you go out further and further so that you're out beyond our solar system, you're out beyond our galaxy at really large distances, the galaxies aren't pulling on each other anymore. They're pushing or something in between them is pushing. And it's as though there's an anti-gravity sort of out there. And we thought ever since we found out that the universe was expanding or the galaxies are moving away from each other, which is the, the idea of the Big Bang as well, like the universe had a beginning. Ever since we've known that, we thought that gravity should be slowing it down. You know, when you throw the ball up in the air, it slows down and stops and comes back down. Um, but we thought the galaxies should be slowing each other down. It, the question was just, are they slowing each other down enough to make the universe stop and recollapse, or will it expand forever, but at a slowing down rate? Um, but what was discovered that it's actually speeding up. And so trying to explain that needs some, needs some fundamental shift in our understanding of the laws of gravity or the laws of quantum physics. And uh, that's that was way too cool to <laughs> not look at. And, and it's also such a great name, I have to say. Whoever dark came up energy, in marketing yeah. with Dark Energy, yep. like they won the, the yep. comms game with that one. That is a very sexy name. <laughs> yeah, well, we've got, there's two dark things that we that we talk about a lot. Um, there's the dark matter and the dark energy. And the, the dark matter has been known about for um, almost a century now, actually, because the, the expansion of the universe was discovered in the 1920s. Now, there's a what present day Bowling Green in Broome that I believe <laughs> played some role in the discovery of this? Do you remember that story? Yeah, so um, this was another Catalyst episode that I, I this was the first I had um, discovered about this actually was they were involved in um, confirming general rel relativity as a theory of gravity and they did that by watching the bending of light around uh, an eclipse when the sun was eclipsed and they looked at the positions of the stars behind the sun and because of the gravitational field of the sun, the, the light bends and the stars shifted position. And it was and they, all of these people came out from Europe to um, to Australia because this was going to be the best place to view the eclipse. And it was some of the first ever really good data that confirmed that this bending of light happens just as Einstein had predicted. And we were like, well, okay, this general relativity stuff is actually true. <laughs> and they were, had one telescope set up at what's now the Broome Bowling Green and, and developed the photographs there. Yeah, so that was like the base. <laughs> they had the telescopes a little bit away from that and then they brought it back there to do all the developing of the film. And I, I would have been very nervous to be the person who was actually doing the developing of that, that exactly. image. Yeah. But they pressed it. They did it the right way. Yeah, and it all, it, all it, came, right. it all came together. So as you say, there's this, this dark energy and dark matter. And what's known about dark matter so far. Oh, yeah. So dark, dark matter was a, basically as soon as we knew that galaxies existed. So we see these pretty spiral galaxies in the sky. Um, and 
early on, people weren't sure whether these were just spirals of gas that were really close to us or hundreds of billions of stars really far away from us. Because when you're looking up at space, it's really difficult to know whether this dot that you're seeing or this spiral that you're seeing is something that's small close by or big far away. Um, and it was they needed when they finally figured out how to measure distances accurately, they realized that they're, they're these massive things far away. And then they started to look at how they move um, and how they're moving in like orbiting each other. The galaxies, some galaxies are in clusters of galaxies and they orbit each other. It's a really huge scale of thing to think about, but they do. And as soon as they looked at that, it was just blindingly obvious that there was some mass there holding them together that we couldn't see. So you can calculate, you know, if I took a ball on a string and spin it around my head, um, I have to pull with a certain amount of force to keep the ball spinning, otherwise it's going to flop down and hit me in the head. Or, or if the ball spins too fast, it would rip and go away. And the, you could, they measured the, the galaxies and they just didn't have enough force holding them together for the amount of spin that they had. And so they should just have all spun away from each other and, and just flown away from each other. But there were, something was holding them together. And so either our law of gravity is wrong and our calculations were wrong, or there was a lot of mass that we couldn't see. And that was the dark matter that was discovered. And that was in the 1930s. And why can't we see it? So there's lots of stuff that we can't actually see. And um, this one we can't see because it doesn't interact with light. It doesn't emit light in any way. And so it doesn't emit stuff that we could see with our eyes. We can see it by, by its gravitational effect, but we can't see it itself. And for right, this, so something like wind, we can't yeah. see it, but we can see the impact it has. Yeah, so that's the analogy that I would often use. Like if you look out and you see the leaves of a tree blowing around, you're like, hey, something's moving those. But we can't see the air. We can't see it, but we can feel it as we breathe it. We can see it moving things. We can tell it's there. Um, and interestingly, if you go back 200 years, we didn't know what the air was because we didn't actually even have a solid particle theory of matter. We didn't know that matter was made of particles. We didn't know what carbon and oxygen and nitrogen and all of that were. We didn't have the periodic table. And so well, even, how long ago? When did we get the periodic table? That was um, less than 200 years ago. Wow. Yeah. And so that's like really recent in like the <laughs> amount of knowledge that we have now. And I mean, now we know in intricate detail what the air is made of. We can measure it trivially, really easily. And that all of that has happened in the last couple of hundred years. And now right now, when we look up at space, most of the matter in the universe, five times more than the normal matter that we see on the periodic table, the stuff that makes up you and I, is this dark matter. And then even more is dark energy. We don't know what they are, but we can see them by the way they're blowing the galaxies around. Like we see them moving the galaxies, but we can't, we don't yet know what they are. Maybe it will take another 200 years for us to figure that out, but we don't know. Who knows what we'll be able to do once we do figure it out. So as you say, it was sort of in the 20s and 1930s that big discoveries around this dark mm -hmm. matter and dark energy started happening. So scientists have known in principle about this for yeah. some time. What would be the most exciting thing to be able to be discovered about that, what would be the real eureka moment where where you're at now with understanding that? Yeah, well, the back back then that was really a golden age of physics where people were just discovering quantum physics and how the, the bizarre things, there's and just as bizarre as space and time warping, which is the gravitational effects, the quantum physics effects of particles not being exactly where they you think they are and they can be waves and particles at the same time and all sorts of entanglement and weird things going on in the quantum realm um, and at the same time general relativity being developed. And so these two streams of physics were have been being developed and are now both extremely successful theories that have been tested in many, many ways and just passed every test with flying colours until maybe dark energy. And so dark energy was took longer than dark matter to discover. It was discovered in the 1990s and but there were hints of it earlier than that. But the... But... To, in order to explain that, maybe the, the most exciting thing is we might need to bring these two theories together. And we know that the two theories are actually incompatible. As successful as they are, <laughs> they disagree when it comes to the nitty gritty of trying to, because general relativity you need for things that are dense and moving fast and quantum physics you need for the particles and small things. Um, but the they don't work together. Quantum physics doesn't have the ability to calculate things if you warp time and space and stuff. So 
we know that it can't be the end. It's not the, it's not the final theory. And that's really the whole point of doing a lot of these experiments. By looking up in space and seeing things like dark energy, we're testing physics on a level that we can't do on Earth because we don't see these effects on Earth. So we're testing physics at its most extreme with black holes and exploding stars and that kind of stuff so we can better understand the fundamental laws of physics that govern our lives here on Earth. So it could be that both of those theories, even or even Einstein's theories, could be mm-hmm. superseded by a new, bigger Which, theory. Yeah, we expect they will be and we hope that they, they will. So, like, Newton had a fantastic theory of gravity, which we still use when we build buildings and bridges and all of that sort of stuff, or when we're playing um, cricket and throwing balls around. Newton's theory describes that beautifully, because none of that is moving super fast or in strong gravity. But it's not the end theory. It was superseded by Einstein's theory, which predicts everything the same as Newton's theory in those simple cases, but then does the more complicated things better. And now we're looking for the one that's the next step after that. And so that, that's what I try and do. <laughs> that's what you try and do. And the way you try and do that is by studying space. That's giving yeah. you information, allowing you to do experiments that don't aren't possible here. Exactly. On Earth. We don't really want to create a black hole here on Earth. Let's, let's avoid so that. I sort of try to avoid <laughs> asking the black hole because, you know, the thought that there are just great big greedy masses of nothingness <laughs> out there, millions and millions of them that yep. could... I mean, are we in danger of a black hole? Not really. Not really. Not That's really. not the answer. <laughs> I really wanted something much stronger. Like, what a stupid question! Of course, we're not. <laughs> yeah, no, the the we're not we're not at risk of creating one here on Earth. That's for sure. But like, the center of our galaxy has a supermassive black hole at it in the center. We we orbit that supermassive black hole, and if it didn't exist, we wouldn't. The gas that created our sun and our Earth wouldn't have all gathered in a place to make the density of the things that we see. So black holes actually play a really important role in the evolution of galaxies and in us being here at all. So you think of them as bringers of life. A friend. Think of it as, as a friend. <laughs> but aren't they constantly eating and sucking in matter they, into them? They are, but so is our sun. Our sun is like stuff is falling, asteroids and stuff are falling into our sun all the time. The difference with a black hole is that you can't escape again once you fall in. But if you take our sun and you compress it into something the size of the Earth, it too would be a black hole. And we could just happily still orbit it without falling in. So it doesn't like it's not like a, an eternal like sucky thing. It's just you can happily orbit the black hole just like you could anything else of the same mass. Um, it's just that if you go too close, you'll never escape again. So, but I'm not going to wake up and discover that I'm breakfast for a black hole. No, not anytime soon. Okay, that, I'm going to take that. That's yeah. going to be. I'm going to yeah. hold on. I'm going to hold on to that. Tamara, the intellectual excitement that you have around these questions is is palpable, you know, and I think it's shared by so many astrophysicists, cosmologists. What about the practical applications? Mm -hmm. Where does some of what you're learning up there, big brain, how does it work day to day in people's lives? Yeah, well, uh, it it spills over into so many different technologies. I already mentioned GPS, some of Wi-Fi, the the code that makes Wi-Fi was... um, patented by some CSIRO scientists that were working on black holes at Parkes Radio Telescope, trying to make radio signals from black holes um, process faster. They, you know, they're like, oh, this might be useful for other things as well. And, you know, it became one of the core things in Wi-Fi. Uh, The kinds of things that we do to try and make images clear in astronomy have now been applied in medical imaging and in radiotherapy and make uh, making radiotherapy experiments cheaper. And the people that we train um, and... Uh, in doing all of these things have gone on to a variety of like like heaps of different roles in data science and um, environmental science and basically the doing the kinds of technology that end up um, in your everyday lives the kind we're trying to build better t- cameras for our telescopes and things that you know some of the early investment in digital cameras came from astronomers trying to get better images of the sky and being able to precisely measure things so while the big picture of what we're questing for is sort of big and maybe esoteric and like not obviously connected to what we're doing on every day the actual practical applications of striving to make the equipment to be able to do that and then the skills that people learn while trying to do that spill out into everyday life and have a great benefit to society. And how closely are you going to be watching the NASA YouTube channel over the next 
weeks and months. I'm gonna. I really want to watch more of the the sort of excitement of the people as new new stuff comes in. I think I, every time we have a landing like there was this morning, I, I tear up a little bit with as it as you just see these people who have invested so much time and effort and literally decades of their life to making these missions work. That nervousness of will it actually land or will it crash, and then it actually being successful is um, just so inspiring and joyful. And I want to see more of that. Tamara, thank you so much for being my guest today on Conversations. Thank you so much. If you enjoyed this episode of Conversations, then have a look at our playlist here and choose another episode to listen to. Or you can follow Conversations on the ABC Listen app and create your own playlist so you can listen to us anywhere, anytime that suits you.